Father and our God, we thank you because of the gospel which you have planned, which you have made provision for, and which you have revealed unto us. We praise your name because you have drawn us to yourself through the power of that gospel. And you have given us the commission to go and preach that gospel to all the people in every nation and in every land. We're asking that you'll wake us up and equip us and empower us so that we'll be able to do what you want us to do in preaching the gospel. And as we preach, we're asking that your power, your enablement, your enablement will follow us in Jesus' name. Amen. And Lord, as we preach, thousands and millions will come into the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, I want to read verses 5 to 8. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching, the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Verses 30 to 35. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before a shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself, of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21, verse 8. And the next day, we that were Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. We're studying about the life and the ministry of Philip. As you will recollect, he was one of the seven that were chosen when the apostles said it is not reasonable for us to leave the preaching of the word and to be serving the tables. And the apostles directed that as there were 12 apostles, the apostles of the Lamb, at that time, they should choose seven men, men among them, men that were known to them of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And we're told the same pleased the whole multitude. And he chose seven men. These seven men, I told you, had four qualities or characteristics. Number one, they were people among the children of God. They were known. They were saved and they were brothers. Two, they were men of honest report outside and within the fold, they knew them to be of Christian character. Number three, they were full of the Holy Ghost, which means they were under the control of the Holy Ghost, under the influence and the leadership of the Holy Ghost every time. And number four, 
they were full of wisdom. And he chose them. The first one to be chosen was Stephen. And then the second, Philip. And then the rest were chosen. We have looked at the ministry of Stephen. And we are now looking at the ministry of Philip. He started as a worker in the church. But the Lord tells us much of his life. One, in the church, a worker. In the home, a father. On the field, in the world, a preacher. And as we see the life of Philip, in the church, in the world, and in the home, we're specifically told that this Philip actually was a New Testament example of an evangelist. I told you that the word evangelist appears in the New Testament, in the English um, Bible, three times. I've read one to you. Philip the evangelist is mentioned in Acts 21 verse 8. Then in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now, even though we're giving just one recorded example of an evangelist, we know that in the early church, there were many evangelists. Because we're told he gave some as a gift in the church, as instruments in the church. Some were having the office of apostles, not one, some. Some had the office and the work and the ministry of prophets, not one, some. And some had the ministry, the office of evangelists, not one, some. And some were pastors, some teachers. In Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Now, here the Apostle Paul was telling young Timothy, who obviously was a pastor, and obviously was a teacher, but then he was also told, beyond the teaching, beyond the pastoral work, do the work of an evangelist. I told you that in these three passages, the evangelist is mentioned specifically. But then there are other passages of the Bible where the evangelist is referred to. Now if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and I read verse 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 28. And God has set some in the church. First, apostles. Secondly, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then, gifts of healing, health, government, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? In this passage I have read to you, we have the mention of the apostles. And the word of God says, and God has set some in the church, some in the church, first apostles. Secondly, following after the apostles, prophets, thirdly, teachers. Now, do you realize something? The difference between the passage I'm reading to you in First Corinthians and the one in Ephesians. In the Ephesians, it just says, and it gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. But now in this passage in 1 Corinthians, he says, first, second, third, after that, then. Now you see in this passage, he's ordering them. And he said, number one, on top of the whole list, apostles. Second, following after that, the prophets. And thirdly, following after the apostles and the prophets, you have the teachers. Then he says, after that, which means number four, 
Then he says, then, which means uh, going on down the list. Now, the apostle is not the apostle is mentioned, the prophet is mentioned, the teacher is mentioned. How about the pastor? How about the evangelist? They are mentioned too. But then, not using the name pastor teacher, or pastor evangelist rather, but look at this. Miracles, gifts of healing. That's the evangelist. That's the evangelist. Because as you study the life of the evangelist, he is the one that is the announcer of the good news. The announcer of the gospel, the proclaimer. And as he proclaims, he proclaims Jesus the Savior, Jesus the Redeemer, Jesus the Healer, Jesus the Deliverer. And the gift of a working of miracles and the gifts of healing, they flow freely in the life, in the ministry of a New Testament evangelist. Now he says, helps. Who do you call for help? When the church member is in trouble and he needs counseling and support and encouragement and a helping hand, that's the pastor's work. Governments, who orders the whole thing, who supervises the whole thing, who um, makes sure that uh, the government or the ruling uh, in the church is the way it ought to go, the administration in the church, the organization in the church, that's the pastor right there. That's the pastor right there. He says the uh, first apostles, for uh, secondary prophets and thirdly teachers, after that, evangelists. After that again, you have the helps, the government, you have the pastor. And then are all apostles? The answer is no. Are all prophets? The answer is no. Are all teachers? The answer is no. Are all evangelists working miracles and manifesting the gifts of healing in this measure? And the answer is no. Now, so you can see that even though you don't have the direct mentioning of the evangelist in other passages, the evangelist is referred to. Now, in Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 4. For we have, as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on a ministry. Or he that teaches on teaching, he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. About that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Now here, without mentioning directly the apostle, the pastor, the evangelist, the pa and um, the prophet and the teacher, he just uh, gives the offices, the things that are done. But then, though we have many references and many people that clearly show the work of an evangelist, there is only one that is given out to us as the New Testament or a New Testament evangelist, and that is Philip. Because we read in Acts 21 verse 8 about Philip the evangelist. And as we study the ministry of the evangelist, it's very important that we look at Philip very, very closely. Very, very closely. Because he gives us the outline of the life and the work and the outreach and the ministry and the gift, the task of the, evan the evangelist. The true evangelist preaches the gospel. The true evangelist preaches the gospel. In Mark chapter 15, chapter 16 rather, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, you say, but that is for everybody. Yes, but listen to me. We're supposed to be fishers of men. But the members of the church use just the hook. 
they throw that in the sea in the river and they get the fish one at a time the evangelist does not use a single hook the evangelist uses a net he throws that into the sea of humanity and he gathers a multitude at a time oh yes we're all preaching the gospel we're all supposed to testify to witness and to draw people to the kingdom of god but then the evangelist has the special task of throwing the gospel net and catching much many at a time in romans chapter 1 verse 15 So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. In Romans chapter 15, Verses 19 and 20. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Now, do you realize? The work of a pastor is building on another's foundation. Because already the souls are one, the sheep are in the fold, and the pastor is supposed to feed the sheep. Somebody has been working on those people and has brought them into the church. And now the pastor is supposed to feed them. The foundation has been laid already. Do you realize that the teacher in the church is teaching people who have already been one, building on another's foundation? Because some other people have given up the gospel. They have evangelized and they have brought in the people. And the teacher comes in and he comes to teach them doctrine, the word of God, so that they can be established. But somebody brought them before we can establish them. But the evangelist is the one that is going to the regions beyond. And he's able to go and preach the gospel to those who never heard before. Where Christ was not named. The evangelist is the one that is reaching out with the gospel message and he has just one message. You've seen the life and the ministry of Philip and you've seen what he preached. We're told in Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 verse 5 that he preached Christ unto them. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 verse 12 we're told Philip preached the things concerning the kingdom of God the, and the name of Jesus Christ. In verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now you see that the evangelist must preach the necessity of the new birth. The necessity of the new birth. Ye must be born again. That's the message of the evangelist. He's not um, a teacher. Even if he has a teaching ministry, while he's over there on the field and he's acting as an evangelist, he's not going there to preach any other thing but salvation for the lost. Salvation for sinners. And he preaches the necessity of the new birth. And he tells the people, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He tells them the necessity of getting the word of God, the word of God into them, and believing that word of God, turning away from sin, and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he tells them the simplicity of the new birth. An evangelist does not go to people and then he sounds theological. He's not impressing upon the people how great a preacher he is. What great knowledge he has because he wants to make it as simple as possible. Listen to me. The evangelist is a tree that is having fruit. And the branches of the tree of an evangelist are low enough for a little child to just reach up his hand and take the fruit and then eat the fruit of the gospel. He's a theologian. 
is an academic person, is the one in a seminary that is not interested in making it simple, just driving the people away, is the one representing a tall tree that you need to take a ladder of concordance, a ladder of Bible dictionary, a ladder of a commentary to be able to even understand what this a mighty tree, mighty theologian is saying. For the evangelist, the evangelist is the one that is getting them the gospel and his tree has branches that are low enough for the children to reach up their hand and just to take the fruit of the gospel. You make An evangelist makes the message of salvation of the new birth very simple. And then he tells them the certainty of salvation. One, the necessity. He must, must be born again. Two, the simplicity. That if you call on the name of the Lord, thou shalt be saved. You know that the Philippian jailer asked uh, Paul and said, uh, What shall we do? What shall I do to be saved? How simple it is it? Believe on the Lord and thou shalt be saved. As many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. Even as many as believed on his name, how simple that is. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him. How simple that is. If you will believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus rose from the dead, thou shalt be saved. How simple that is. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. How simple that is. Look unto me, all ye the ends of the earth, and be ye saved because I am God and there is none else. How simple that is. You see, the evangelist is not going for something deep, something high, something great, something theological. He's telling them how they can have the water of life and quench the thirst and the eagerness of their souls. He's telling them how their sins can be washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. And he simply tells them, if you'll just come, if you'll just come and you confess your sin, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He tells him it's so necessary. He tells him it's so simple. And he tells him it's so certain that the moment you do that, the moment you do that, you are not trying to feel. It's just by faith. You trust him. You take him. You depend upon him. And the evangelist will give you illustrations to make it simple for you and to make you understand the moment you have taken that step, you are born again. And then he will end it up by saying, there is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation to them who walk in the spirit because they have believed on the Lord. And he says, being justified, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. The evangelist makes it simple. But then he impresses upon them that today is the hour, today is the time that they must take Jesus to be their savior. And uh, Philip, he did it uh, so wonderfully. As a New Testament evangelist, he preached the gospel and the Lord confirmed the word that he preached. He was fully equipped for the task of evangelizing by Christ himself. Now, do you realize it is Christ who makes one an apostle? makes another a prophet, makes another an evangelist, makes another a pastor, makes another a teacher. It's Christ himself that does it. He gave some. And if he has not given, you cannot receive what he has not given. You cannot take what he has not made available. And you know the Lord is not making available the gift and the ministry of evangelists to everybody. No, not for everybody. Because some, he'll just give them the gift and the ministry and the office of a pastor. For others, he will, he will give them the ministry and the gift and the task and the outreach of an evangelist. He gave some, he gave some, he gave some, not all. Now, but you see, even though only some are evangelists, all are supposed to witness, to testify, to win souls, and to preach the gospel. And I told you the difference just now. I told you that the soul winner, the member of the church, who is winning soul, is all the time giving his testimony. He's all the time sharing the message. He's all the time telling people that they need to, to love the Lord. He's a soul winner. He witnesses to the power of the gospel to save. He's inviting other people to come to the Lord. He's telling them, he did it for me, he can do it for you. 
But the evangelist is different. He's talking to multitudes, multitudes, most of the time. A few times he may talk to individuals, and he should, like a believer. But most of the time, he's talking to multitudes of people to come to the Lord. Now, in um, Psalm 68, As we're opening Psalm 68, let me tell you this. Where the teaching is not clear in the mind of the believer, that not all are evangelists, there will be confusion. And God is not the author of confusion. If God is not the author of confusion, somebody must be the author of confusion. It has to be Satan. And where the teaching is not clear, that we're all supposed to be soul winners, we're all, so, we're all supposed to be giving a testimony, we're all supposed to be witnessing and telling people of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, but not all are, call, are called or supposed to be evangelists, where that is not clear, where that is not clear, there is danger of confusion. One, you know somebody may just say, read the Bible, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then without receiving the gift and the talent, without receiving the anointing and the uh, ministration of the Holy Ghost to be an evangelist, he reaches out, he reaches out. Maybe God was developing him to be a pastor, to just sit down and counsel and help and encourage and rule and feed the flock and gather them together and take them for watering maybe that is what the lord wants him to do he'll be running out he wants to be an evangelist because he has read a verse of the bible going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and he goes without being sent and he's defeated over there and he comes back and the pastor he ought to have been he cannot do it and other people uh, who don't uh, make, uh, who don't understand the difference between the soul winner and the evangelist? You know what may happen? The person may say, well, since everybody can't do it, uh, maybe I will just uh, fold my hand. Uh, maybe I will never be able to do it. Therefore, I just fold my hand. No, you're misunderstanding it. You will not all be pastors. If we're all pastors, who will be prophet? Who will be teacher? Who will be evangelist? But in the wisdom of God, he has set some in the church, some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, and thirdly teachers. After that, after that, after that, working of miracles and the gifts of healing, and then, and then, helps, government, diversities of tongues. And then he has a question, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all uh, workers of miracles do all have the gifts of healing and then he says i show unto you a more excellent way what's the more excellent way discover what god wants you to do and do it in love that's the more excellent way i show unto you a more excellent way the more excellent way is that if god is calling you to be an apostle or god is calling you to be a prophet or god is calling you to be an evangelist or god is calling you to be a pastor or a teacher or just an exhorter to wait on your exhortation or just a singer to sing and win, and win people to the Lord by the singing or just a person that will change heaven, that will rock heaven and move heaven, the hand of God on behalf of other people to intercede, to pray and just to be in the ministry of intercession, whatever it is, the more excellent way is do it in love for the benefit of the whole church. And then he gives you 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm not reading that now. You see, that's the reason we, we need to understand. We need to discover the difference between a soul winner and an evangelist. Now, everybody is supposed to be a soul winner. Everybody, everybody. And you know, Jesus Christ stood in the office of the apostle because he said, my father sent me. He that sent me is always with me. An apostle is somebody sent with a commission and with the power of the commissioner to be able to carry out what is commissioned to do. And you know he was a prophet because uh, that woman by the well said, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. Oh yes, he was. Oh yes, he was. And he looked ahead with the eyes of a prophet and he predicted future events to come. And you know he was an evangelist because he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has, he has chosen me, anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's an evangelist and he was. And you know that he was a pastor because the word pastor is the word, t is the word shepherd. And he said, I'm the good shepherd. I give my life for the sheep. You know he was a teacher too because Nicodemus came and he said, Thou art a teacher come from heaven, from God. And so Jesus, he has shown us an example of all those offices. But more than that, more than that, 
he witnessed, he talked to individuals, sat down by that well, and said, give me water to drink. You see, that is the ministry of everyone, whatever we are going to be called to become. God may be preparing you for a great ministry ahead, but then today, you get involved in the soul winning work, and you talk to individuals, because that is the ministry of every believer. Whatever we are going to do in a special way at a later time, or whatever we are doing in a special way even now, you get into the ministry of the soul winning, which is of soul winning, which is for everybody. Now, Psalm 68, verse 11. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. The Lord gave the word, and we have been given the word today. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus Christ himself, by his death and burial and resurrection, by the atoning work he did, he became the gospel personified. And because we're given the word, the written word and the living word, the saving word and, and the life-giving word, we go out and we give that word to other people so they can be saved. Great was the company of those that published age. In Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. It's our responsibility. We must all do it, the winning of souls. In Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. It's our opportunity. We should be able to do it. We should be doing it. In Mark chapter 5. Reading from verse 18. This man had just been delivered. Obviously he wasn't an evangelist. He couldn't be at this time. Because he had just been delivered from the power of evil spirits. From the authority of the evil spirits. He was possessed. But then after he, he was delivered. The Lord um, told him to say, shouldn't follow, because he just wanted to keep on following the Lord Jesus Christ and to say with Christ. But the Lord said he should go and testify of the great things the Lord had done for him. Mark 5, 18. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. How be it, Jesus suffered him not, permitted him not, but says unto him, Go home to thy friends, tell, and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee, and has had compassion on thee. We all have homes, we all have friends, and each one, each believer that has a home to go back to, that has friends to talk to, he is to go home to his friends and then to tell those friends what great things the Lord has done for him and has had compassion on him. You'll testify, you'll witness about the joy of the Lord in your life, about the victory that God has given you, about the salvation that he has given to you, about the forgiveness of your sin, about the peace of God now that you have as a result of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll testify about your healing, you'll testify about your deliverance, and then the people will be able to come as you are testifying unto them. In verse 20, and he departed and began to publish in the Capolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. In John chapter 4, John chapter 4, verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city. And says to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. That woman had received forgiveness for sin, joy of salvation, peace of heart, rest in the mind, certainty of life after death, eternal life. And she left her water pot and went back to the city, not as an evangelist, not as an evangelist. He gave some a 
apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers special ministries gifts in the church but then everybody is supposed to be able to witness and tell how great things the Lord has done for you in John chapter 17 from verse 15, 16 rather, they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. The question is, who are the people not of the world? Apostles alone? No. Prophets alone? No. Evangelists alone? No. Pastors alone? No. Teachers alone? No. If anybody is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And these who have come to Christ, those who are children of God, they are not of the world. As Christ was not of the world. Not only the ministers, not only the pastors, everyone call, call, calling the name of the Lord. Everyone that is called by the name of the Lord is not of the world, even as Christ was not of the world. And in verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Who are the people supposed to be sanctified? Pastors only? Teachers only? Evangelists only? Apostles only? Prophets only? No. All believers. Now, it is these believers of verse 16 who are not of the world. These believers of verse 17 who the Lord was praying for to be sanctified. It is to them that verse 18 also applies. As thou hast sent me into the world. Even so, have I also sent them into the world. Is that just for apostles alone? No. For evangelists alone? No. For everyone. Everyone. Everyone in the church. Those who are not of the world. Those who come under the praying of Jesus. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then the Lord is saying, O oh Lord, because these are not of the world, as I'm not of the world, because they are followers after me, because they are believers, as you sent me into the world, even so have I sent all of them into the world with the gospel to reach out and to preach. Now you have seen from all that we have been saying that even though we are all called to be soul winners, to witness, to testify, to tell all other people around us of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the work of the evangelist is special. The work of the evangelist is special. And now, Acts chapter 8, we're looking at Philip more closely. As a church, we ought to understand the ministry of the different category of ministers in the church. Now, when we just say 12 apostles, 12 apostles, every believer ought to know who is an apostle. Every believer ought to know whether there were more than 12 apostles in the New Testament. And it might surprise you what you discover when you study the apostles in the New Testament. And when we talk of prophets, we ought to know, we ought to know who the prophets are in the New Testament and what is the ministry of the prophet, what it is all about. And when we talk of the when we talk of the evangelist, we ought to know because if we don't know, how shall we know when the Lord is lifting up an individual, maybe you, to a particular office? And when we talk of a pastor, everybody ought to know what are the functions of the pastor, the role of the pastor, the responsibility of the pastor, and the gifts that are necessary. How the Holy Ghost qualifies and anoints a person for the ministry and the office of a pastor. And when we talk of a teacher, we ought to know who a teacher is according to the New Testament so that uh, it's not uh, the idea we had, you know, from primary school. You know, the Sunday school teacher uh, that um, keeps us quiet when uh, we're making noise in the primary section, primary class. Now, is that the teacher in the New Testament? Think about it. And today in the church, uh, does it mean that uh, when we put somebody there to teach the scripture, is that what the Bible is referring to us? He gave some pastors and teachers, teachers, he gave them, not just an opportunity to teach on one Sunday, but as a ministry, as an office, with the anointing, with the power, with the knowledge, with the experience, with the calling of a teacher, the, the church ought to know. But today we're studying about the evangelist. And when you see one, you ought to be able to tell 
in um, Acts chapter 8. I, I want to read verses 4 and 5. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. Verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. You have the word preaching in verse 4. You have the word preached in verse 5. I told you before, two weeks ago, that the word preaching in verse 4 is totally different from the word preach in verse 5. The Greek is different. And I, I told you that in verse 4 it just means passing the news around. Giving the news to another person. Announcing the news to another individual. And that's what every believer does. They went everywhere preaching the word, young Elizo. Which means you just give the message, the good news. Have you heard? Have you heard about Jesus? Have you heard about life eternal? Have you heard of the grace of the Lord? I've got it. I've seen it. I've benefited from it. It can be yours. Passing it around. Passing it around. Good news. Good because it is relevant to that individual. News because he has never heard it before. And that is the responsibility of every believer. Now about in verse 5, the word preach is keruzo. And it means to proclaim it. A proclaimer of the good news. A person that is set up in an office, in a ministry, in a task, to declare it openly to a large crowd. And that's what Philip did as an evangelist. And so you can see between verses 4 and 5, the difference between the soul winner and the evangelist. I'm spending time on this because I want you to understand that we're all called to be soul winners. Tell everybody around. But then only some will be evangelists. Now, we want to see three things in this evangelist. And these three things we must see in every evangelist. One, the magnanimity. The broad-mindedness. The generosity. A broad heart. A, a person that just... A, there is a place in his heart for everybody on the face of the earth. His heart is as large as the whole world. It's not just, you know, a, a person stationed in one place. It's a person, his eyes are just in the ends of the world. When he's in Jerusalem, he doesn't see the color of the face. He doesn't see the color of the skin. He doesn't see the language. He just sees the people that he created in the image of God, but who have lost the image and the glory because they have seen and come short of the glory of God. And there is a burden within his heart. There is a vision within his mind. And there is a desire to give the gospel unto them, whether they be men or women, whether they be Jew or Gentile, whether they be literate or educated. There is a large place, a large portion in his heart for the people that are lost in sins and dead in sins and trespasses. That's the magnanimity. But then the message. Now, as he has said, uh, this large heart, broad mind, and all the time his eyes are in the ends of the world, he wants to announce the gospel to everybody that he can find. He has only one message. Only one message. Listen to me. And you watch a true evangelist, a true evangelist, no matter where he goes in the Bible. If he's reading the account of creation, he's telling you that God created the world and telling you a story. And while he's reading the story of creation and he's telling you how the Lord created and he created people in the image of God, eventually he will end up. You have not lost that glory and that image and now you need to come to the Lord and he'll begin to preach salvation. He may be reading the account of uh, Genesis chapter 3 where you are talking about uh, the temptation of um, Adam and Eve and how they fell. Now he's going to just tell you that story in an interesting way, simple way before he ends up in is going to tell you that it's the devil has come to you before too he has tempted you you are falling and now jesus christ has come and he has died on the cross of calvary he may just be reading about the account of abel and cain and you know if a teacher is reading that it is different if a pastor is reading that it is different but an evangelist when he's reading of um, of abel and cain eventually is going to tell you the depravity in the heart of man that made cain to kill abel and is going to invite you to come to the lord how you can and be free from that depravity and sin. He may be reading the account of Abraham or Isaac. He may be reading of Jacob. He may be reading of Joseph. But wherever he is reading the Old Testament or New Testament, he is going to end up with calm and you can get saved. That's the evangelist. That's the evangelist. Everywhere he goes in the Bible. Now he may even be talking about marriage. 
And you know, when an evangelist is talking about marriage, he is not a teacher, he is not a pastor. And eventually he's going to be talking to you that you know that Jesus Christ came the bridegroom and he wants to get married to you and before he can get married to you, you just need to clean up and to clean up you need to wash in the blood of Jesus. I'm saying that whatever topic and whatever passage an evangelist is talking about is going to end up talking about salvation for the sinner. He's going to talk he's going to end up inviting the people to come to the Lord and get saved. You know he may talk about the rapture. He may talk about the great tribulation. He may talk about the second coming of Christ. But now he's going to tell you that right now, if you want to get uh, through at that time, Jesus is standing at the door of your heart and he's knocking. And if you open your heart, he'll come, unto, he'll come into you and you'll become saved. Wherever the evangelist goes in the Bible, whatever the evangelist is talking about, is going to end up preaching Christ and preaching salvation. And then his um, ministration. You know that uh, the evangelist, I mean, according to the New Testament, is an individual that is able to show that power of the gospel. He's able to show that power. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to open the prison doors for the captives, and to bind up the brokenhearted. Now, the work of an evangelist also demands that there will be an anointing, the overflowing of the Spirit of God to be able to help him through, to minister to the sick, to minister to those who are depressed and oppressed by the evil spirits and is able to get them delivered by the power of the Lord. Now, let's see all these things in the life of Stephen, sorry, of uh, Philip. First, the magnanimity. Two, or second, the message. And third, the ministration. It's not magnanimity. Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now the Jews hated the Samaritans. And the Samaritans had nothing to do with the Jews. Let me just refresh your memory. In John chapter 4, verse 9. John chapter 4, verse 9. Then says the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And so you can see there was racial prejudice, cultural barrier, or what you may call a, a, a tribal partition dividing them that uh, they will generally not even want to relate with the other but you know the evangelist has nothing like that in his mind well it is true my brother my sister as a christian you shouldn't have anything in your mind against um, the samaritans or the jews or people of another ethnic group or another tribe because we're a new creature and Christ has broken down the middle wall of partition. Because right now what is important is just that we're a new creature and in the church we do not know any of these uh, tribal things. But more so, more so, more so for the evangelist. He has a place in his heart for everybody. And there is such a love, a deep love, a deep com- compassion in his heart for everybody. And, you know, the evangelist is touched with the feeling of the infirmities of those people that are living without Christ. And all the time, the tears of compassion and tears of mercy and tears of sympathy. Trinity, I want to go to the regions beyond. I want to go to the people that have never heard about Jesus. They may be Jews, they may be Gentiles, they may be Samaritans, or they may be illiterate. Whatever they are, I want to go to them. He, he has a heart for the philosophers as well as for the barbarians and he, he seems to be pushed on all the time you know the pastor will be wondering when he sees an evangelist because the pastor's heart is different the pastor is the person that is able to sit down in one place preach to the same congregation for 20 years for 30 years and you know the evangelist will be wondering how on earth could a person have the spirit of God in him and he can stay in one congregation for 20, 30 years and he preaches every Sunday he ministers every Sunday seeing the same people that's the pastor because he is able to stay as a shepherd over those people to feed the flock the evangelist will be wondering what makes that man sit down like that is the pastor's heart but you know the pastor too will be wondering 
This man is never stable in one place. He's been to that city and people have come to the Lord. He doesn't even sit down to take care of them and to preach to them and to pastor them. He can do that because he's just an evangelist. While he's finishing this meeting, according many people to the Lord, his heart is reaching out again. His heart is reaching out again. He wants to get to another place where people have never heard of the saving grace and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the evangelist. He has a base in the church because I told you that Philip was a worker in the church, a father in the home, a preacher in, on the field, in the world. And so uh, you can see that there is that magnanimity in the heart of the evangelist. And he wants to reach out and he doesn't care about the color, about the tribe, and about the language, and about what people do, what people say. He's not concerned about the politics of, of the land. It's not concerned about any other thing, but about an opportunity to be able to preach the gospel unto them. There is no evangelist, I mean a real New Testament evangelist, who can allow himself or herself to have racial prejudice, cultural, tribal barrier to hinder the preaching of the gospel. An evangelist uh, who wants to take the saving life-giving gospel to the regions beyond, he must have the mind of Christ, not calling any city or any nation common or unclean. And Philip did not allow the cultural difference and deep, the deep-rooted hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans to hinder his throwing out the lifeline. He went down to the city of Samaria and he did something. He preached Christ unto them. Now, you've seen the heart of the evangelist. Now, the message of the evangelist. You've seen it, but let's see it again. Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached, and preached, and preached Christ unto them. And you know something? You need to watch a real evangelist. A real evangelist. When um, he's doing the work of an evangelist. To really understand the ministry of the evangelist. Do you know that the evangelist generally does not end up with the death on the cross? No. You know the evangelist does not end up with something negative. He, he will mention the death on the cross. He may mention the burial of Jesus Christ. He's always ending up with the victory of resurrection telling them they can be justified by faith because Jesus Christ rose up for them. He's talking about Jesus and he makes Jesus so attractive you'll want to receive him into your heart. He makes Jesus Christ uh, so victorious you'll want to be, you'll want to have him as a captain of your ship, of your soul. He makes Jesus Christ the redeemer and he paints the picture so well. He talks about Jesus. You'll pity yourself. You have not known about it for so long. He makes Jesus Christ what the Father has sent him to do to save the whole world that will just come rushing forward wanting to receive the Lord as your personal savior that's the evangelist so the message of an evangelist the message is talking about Jesus Christ in his capacity in his capacity to save oh yes the evangelist will warn the people but he doesn't leave them in the fire of hell he doesn't leave them at the gate of hell if he could he'll take his two hands and pick them up and he'll bring them to the gate of heaven and tell them that is heaven if you want to enter enter that's the evangelist but you know he's a person who doesn't have the gift of the evangelist the ministry of the evangelist and the task of the evangelist who will preach and he will leave the congregation he will leave the hearers maybe on the field or, or in the bus or anywhere at the gate of hell an evangelist doesn't do that an evangelist doesn't do that an evangelist will take the people from the dungeon to the throne will take the people from the gate of hell right to the gate of heaven he cannot push them in but he can drag them along until they get to the gate and he'll tell them the door is open the opportunity is yours the salvation is available he step forward and you enter into that gate that's the evangelist and many times because people do not understand the ministry of an evangelist the anointing the unction that is on an evangelist you know we just make a mess of the whole thing now we're told about philip he preached christ unto them the message is, is still the same and it is that we are separated from God. But an evangelist never stops there. In Christ and Christ alone, by his death and resurrection, we can be saved. If you preach any other message, you'll not be an evangelist. You know, just telling people to live a better life. 
Uh, you know, you, you see sometimes the people who preach and they say, well, uh, sin is bad, sin is bad. That's true. Now, you do your best and get away from sin. That's not true. They cannot do their best and get away from sin. They cannot do it. They cannot do it. Only Christ can save them from sin. Only the blood of Jesus can wash whiter than snow. You turn over a new leaf. You become a better person. No. As bad as they are, Jesus will pick them up and wash them and cleanse them and make them children of God. And he will give something into them, the grace of God, the power of the gospel to make them go and sin no more. It's not by trying not to sin. It's just by not sinning because of the grace of God that has come into their lives. And so the message is still the same. And you see many preachers or many evangelists preach uh, uh, such a message that they are not able to communicate to the people they are talking to about the Lord Jesus Christ. Who says? Now listen to me. When a lady sees a beautiful man, handsome man, strong man, rich man, and that man is giving an invitation saying, I'll just take care of you. That lady will not be able to receive. There will be an attraction to that man. When a man sees a beautiful lady and that lady just promises everything, says, you know, I'll just take care of you and uh, I, I, I want to be for you all my life and all that I have. Uh, the way I know, I'll just make you happy all the rest of your life. Uh, man will not be able to receive that attraction. And when you present Jesus Christ as the attractive Savior, the powerful Savior, who in him, the fullness of the Godhead is complete. And he's able to take care of that sinner, that criminal, that alcoholic person, that drunkard. He's able to take care. He's able to brush his life, cleanse his life, renew his life, change his life, transform his life. And he's able to give him all the desires that he ever desired in his life. That sinner will not be able to resist the attraction to Jesus Christ. You know, when you lift up that Jesus Christ, and you're not lifting up sin, you're not lifting up Satan, you're not uh, lifting up hell, you you are talking about Jesus, the shepherd. You are talking about Jesus and his blood. You are talking about Jesus and his love and his compassion and his mercy. They will not be able to resist coming to the Lord. They will want to come. And that's what the evangelist does. You know, he's a person that is not called to be an evangelist. Who is trying to be. That is preaching and is telling the people, God is going to destroy you. You know, that's not an evangelist. Is that good news? You know that I was in my house, enjoying my drinking, enjoying my smoking, and I had a lot of problems, and then somebody came to me, and he said, I bring good news to you. And I said, well, I'm so glad I want to hear it. And he said, well, God is angry at you, and um, he can throw you into hell right now. And uh, he, will, he will kill you, he will destroy you, he will burn you in hell, and you will burn and burn a thousand years, a million years, and you have just started. And I was, uh, I was looking at him and he said, well, well, Jesus is able to say, but you will pray, you will cry, you will, you will labor. And then he tells me about Jesus five minutes and he tells me about my sin, about my evil, about my, about my waywardness, about the judgment and the destruction for one whole hour. And uh, after he has gone, I became so confused. That's not an evangelist. He's not bringing to me good news. It's not telling me how to come out of the dungeon of sin where I am. If it's an evangelist, is taking me out of the place I am and is getting me to the gate of hell so I can enter very easily. Now, listen to me. The message of the evangelist is the same, but the method varies from place to place. And I've been trying to tell you this. Listen to me. I was um, in America many, some years ago. And uh, as I was there, I saw some people riding horse. And I asked uh, an American or an vehicle together, I said, uh, these people, why are they riding horse? You know what he told me? He said, those people are a type of Christians reading the Bible. They, we, they knew that we had been riding horses before, many years ago, when there was no vehicle. But when the vehicle came, they said they were old-fashioned. They were going to keep with their horses. And they kept on riding horses. Aeroplane came. They said, no, we just want to keep to the Bible. Jesus did not ride a car. And we're going to follow Jesus to the end. Think about it. Jesus did not go into an aeroplane. We are Christians, old-fashioned. We're going to just remain riding horses all our lives. 
If they are saved, thank God, they will get to heaven. They will get to heaven. God will not punish them for not riding a car. God will not punish them for not, uh, for not riding, uh, for not going in the aeroplane. But the place they should have gone, they will not be able to get there. They will not be able to get there. And I was surprised when I saw them. I said, so such people are here. They said, there are even many. Think about it. In America. And you know that that is what some people do with the preaching of the gospel. When I was young, I used a candle and lantern to read my books. But then when I became older, I was in a city where there was electricity. And I used electric light. Now, as we're sitting there, we're using electricity tonight as we read our Bible. When you were young, about five years of age, about ten years of age, how many of you um, lived in a house where there was no electricity and you used um, uh, just a candle or lantern? Can you raise up your hand and let me see you? Are you people Christians? Are you Christians? Why are you not old-fashioned? And remain with your lantern. And remain old-fashioned. My brother, I'm giving you a message. I'm saying this. The world is changing. Technology is changing. And we have opportunities today. You know there is loudspeaker. We use it. It wasn't available at that time, but we're using it today. And there, uh, the newspapers are there. We can use it. They were not available. Then they're available today. The methods may change. The methods may change. And today, you can reach people over the television. The method may change, but it's the same message. If you are keeping the message, that's, the, that's all the Lord wants you to do. And you're reaching out to multitudes, whether it is over the radio or over the television or through the newspapers. The important thing is get the message out. The method may change over the years. Now, the ministration. He ministered in the power of the Lord. And in Acts chapter 8... Verse 6, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many that were taken with palsies, and that were lame, and they were healed. And there was great joy in that city. The miracles were a means of supernatural advertisement for the power of the gospel. Miracles and healing draw multitudes to so Christ and then prepare them to hear the gospel. And do you know that even after people are saved, when they see miracle, their faith will develop faster. When they see miracle, their faith will be confirmed. When they see miracle, they'll be strengthened in their faith. And today we thank God because as we go and as we preach, the Lord still confirms the word that is preached with signs following. And we have the opportunity today as soul winners. To reach out to the gospel. We have the privilege, if God is calling us to be evangelists, to develop. And um, you know, there is a way you can develop your ministry. If God is calling you to be an apostle, to be a prophet, to be an, to be an evangelist, to be a pastor, to be a teacher, there is development. You can develop. And um, every minister of the gospel ought to be developing. And as we go on in all this series, the Lord will lead us how to discover our ministry, how to make use of that ministry in the church, and how to grow, how to develop in the ministry that God has given us. Whatever you have learned today, I want you to take it to the Lord in prayer, that the Lord himself will make this word alive within you, and you'll be the person that God wants you to be. Rise up and let us pray. For all that he's teaching us, all the things we have been exposed to, you've seen the evangelist, in the New Testament, you've seen the magnanimity in the heart of the evangelist, the broad mindedness, the compassion, the mercy, the love, the eagerness and the desire to tell the lost of the Savior. Now you tell the Lord that as a soul winner, God will make you to be faithful. God will help you to be faithful in whatever you are doing today so that he can give you something that he has for you in future, for tomorrow.